Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, people of infinite consciousness. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. It is November 12th, 2014. I'm your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, every Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Today on the show, we will have Dr. Carmen Bolter, who is best known as the director and producer of the documentary channel series, The Pyramid Code. And it is a little bit of a miracle that that five-part series, masterpiece series, managed to get on television. You know, television is meant to brainwash you. And the documentary channel, every so often comes up with a good documentary like The Pyramid Code and also Eat the Sun, which was about sun gazing, which my listeners know I love. But the Pyramid Code revealed new insight into the history of ancient Egypt and how consciousness and time cycles work. Carmen has had an unshakable passion for Egypt, traveling there 25 times. Wow, do you ever get bored? Not her, because she's always on a mission to expose the false mainstream nature of Egypt's, ancient Egypt's reality for what it for what it is. Uh, through MSC support, Carmen did extensive research into the archives of the Egyptian Museum, gaining official access to the Rare Books Library of the Facility of Archaeology, Cairo University, where the field notes of excavations done around the pyramids in the early 90s, excuse me, in the early 1900s are held. Carmen is the author of Angels and Archetypes, an Evolutionary Map of Feminine Consciousness. Over the past decade, Carmen has been a university professor developing online curriculum. Her latest achievement is interactiveu.com. That's interactive hyphen the letter U dot com, an online learning and social action network. Her sites are the uh, are pyramidcode.com and also that interactive U site. But first, before I get to the news, I'd like to um, tell a little bit of a life story here. I don't want to bore you by telling life stories, but this ties in directly with something that I've talked about many times on Nature of Reality Radio. The fact that y- you sometimes just can't try to get people along to fight for freedom and liberty and not have some infighting or some bias. I found that out when I realized uh, on November 9th, uh, three days ago, that I got banned for eternity from the Resistance United Patriot Movement group that I was in. Now, I want to say I have no bad feelings for them. They have the they can do whatever they they want in this regard because they are a, a private company. It is a private company. But for them to do this to me is a classic example of well, I don't I don't really know. I'll I'll explain what happened. Uh now I want people to to support this group even though I'm not with them support them. They've done well and well, let me just tell you what happened. They wanted me to come on their radio show, the Resistance United radio show to tell a story about the story of the ETs on planet Earth and all, the ET cover-up and everything like that, and and UFOs too. And I told them, well, if you want to get me on the show, just give me a week's notice. Best way to um, to do this, to tell people, to convince people that there is an ET cover-up is to let them know that they're, that the moon above the Earth, they're not being told what, what it actually is. It's artificial. Yeah, the moon is artificial. And I can explain all that, and that'll make people know that they have no choice but to believe in ETs on planet Earth. And he said, okay. And then I posted um, one of my radio show links. I believe it was the show with uh, Prima Lee and uh, John Thompson. Yeah, that one. In the um, the Resistance United Forum. And then I find out that a few days later that I can't log into the site anymore. But that was before um, uh, the Resistance United member uh, asked me if I would post anything Christian. And I said, no, because I'm not a Christian Therefore, I um, don't have any reason to put Christianity-related stuff in this group unless it ties in with the First Amendment. And I was under the impression that I could talk about the metaphysical beliefs that I believe, and it wouldn't be a problem. But then I find out that I get banned from the group a couple days later. And then I asked, have I been banned entirely? And the group leader said, yes, you you are no longer with us. And I asked him, what for? I have no reason to believe I did anything wrong. Uh, I told you I wasn't a Christian and, and all that stuff, and you wanted me on the radio and all. And he said, some of the members of the group, including me, do not feel that you... Um, fit in with this group. We wish you luck. You're very good at what you do. Have a good day. I don't wish to debate this any further. Uh, I don't know if I freaked them out when I said what I said about what I wanted to discuss on the radio and and that and not being Christian, I didn't think that was a problem, but it just goes to show you that like what I want to do, I want to combine the work of the spirituality and metaphysics communities with the works of the conspiracy and patriot communities because I feel we got to all get together, even though we don't necessarily see eye to eye on things. If we don't get together, it, we won't be able to beat the powers that be. And, and well, I, I try to do that in this um, patriot group that I'm a member in, and now I find out I get expelled. <laughs> wow. This is a tough matrix to live in, isn't it? But with that being said, 
well, actually, with that being said, before I get to the news, please support the Resistance United. I said it once, I'll say it again. I will not have any hard feelings for them. They have the right to do this. So there's no sense for me to seek any glorified revenge or anything like that because I don't seek any of that. No. I want I want them to go far. I even asked my guardian angels and spirit guides the day I found out I got expelled. Uh, let the Resistance United um, perform well, help them perform well, even though they won't uh, have me with them. I wish them well, and I asked my angels and spirit guides to help me that, and I hope they listened. But, uh, well, I'll miss that Patriot group. I really enjoyed it. But anyway, uh, moving on to news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. I'll make sure I get Carmen on at 10 after the hour, so I'll do this on the fly here. A third Gruber video reveals Holy Administration sought to hide Obamacare tax. So basically, it's the same thing. We just tax insurance companies. They pass on higher prices. Yes, uh, how many more videos do the American people need to see before they realize that Obamacare is a tax that's designed to uh, screw us over and uh, keep us from getting good health care? This guy said the American voters are stupid. He actually said that. Well, many of them are, but but this is another video, and uh, they want insurance companies. They want to make the uh, mom-and-pop insurance companies go out of business, only the big ones that control the government to a great extent. They're the only ones that want to be in power. Next article. Feminist demand censorship of Princess Leia catcalling parody video. Wow, this video should be reported. Dislike and taken down, one feminist woman said. I have not seen the video. I, I'm assuming it's just a natural reaction to the fact that there's going to be an episode 7 of the Star Wars movies, not directed by George, George Lucas this time. And let me make it clear, as we discussed in my uh, interview with Ray Kusalanich, um last week, discussing E.T. races and all, the Star Wars creators, George Lucas and all the people on the, on his team, they were not idiots. They know the name of the two, and they're, in many ways, the movies of Star Wars and other movies in Hollywood are truth under the guise of fiction. But but anyway, getting back to the topic, I don't know what this Princess Leia thing is all about. You're welcome to check it out yourself, but maybe it's just another way to divide and conquer by feminists disliking something really childish and trivial. Uh, next article. Under Texas bill, cops do collect traffic fines on the spot via credit or debit card. House Bill number 121 attempts to essentially legalize highway robbery. Well, this ties in directly with something that I've mentioned many times on my show. Anyone who listens to me knows that I am on a crusade to get the word out about a video called Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know. It's on the Alex Jones channel. In that video, former sheriff's deputy and rule of law radio host Eddie Craig uh, exposes how if you're not a commercial driver, you do not need a license insurance registration or license plate because only people in commerce are required to have those things. Driving is a privilege, they say. That's only true if you're a commercial driver. Non-commercial, you don't need that, and you're not bound by transportation laws. Of course, you can still be charged with negligence, reckless endangerment, and property damage, but you can't be charged with speeding, red lights, illegal illegal turns, because those are only for commercial drivers. But this law, I'm sure they're getting kind of desperate to make sure that Eddie Craig's information doesn't get out to many people, so they're just going to legalize highway robbery with this Texas bill, which uh, allows them to collect traffic fines. Okay, make sure you spread Eddie Craig's video like wildfire so this doesn't happen. All right, next article. Russia announces deployment of bombers over Gulf of Mexico. Announcement follows NATO moves in Eastern Europe. Well, I'm sure the uh, powers that be are a little fed up with uh, the BRICS nation, Vladimir Putin and all all the other leaders of the BRICS nations because they want to dump the um, dollar as the global reserve currency and uh, go to something else. I mean, they're all and paid for by the special interests all the national governments are, but that doesn't mean that the the national governments aren't factionalized, so to speak, to the point where the world leaders will try to not do what their New World Order masters tell them to do. And Putin is in some sense this regard. I don't know if this was planned by the powers that be or not to have these bombers over the Gulf of Mexico, but um, whatever. You can't really trust the Russians. You can't trust anybody because it's all bond. They probably have the same special interests. <laughs> can't trust mainstream science either when it comes to ancient Egypt. All right, next article. Um, survey. Americans have smartened up to the mass government spying. 80% are concerned about NSA surveillance. Yeah, NSA surveillance has nothing to do with safety. It has nothing to do with national security. It's designed to help them predict future trends so they can elite, engage in eagle trading on the stock market. It's to prevent whistleblowers from coming out and blackmail people by scrutinizing they, they, something that they did in the past. And, of course, people behave differently when they're being spied on, so they want to suppress the consciousness of humanity. It has nothing to do with safety. That's all a lie. All right, next uh, article. D.C. schools strip, strip Christmas from calendar after Muslims complain. Move doesn't go far enough, say it's pressure groups. <sighs> okay, uh, whatever happened to the First Amendment right to freedom of religion? <sighs> okay, our next article. China jail CIA's uh, Uyghur Imas. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Uyghur Imas. Uh, imams, Muslims, uh, 
where, where President Osama bin Laden's CIA, uh, CIA ISI Afghan training camps. Uh, okay, um, we all know the raid, um, the Osama bin Laden raid never actually happened, complete total hoax there. Um, don't have time to look into this article to talk what it's all about, but uh, one last article here. Second video emerges of Obamacare architect calling Americans stupid. Oh, I mentioned this earlier, so I don't think I really need to uh, talk about this any further. So um, without further ado, let's, I believe this is Carmen Bolter in the queue. Area code 661, is this Carmen Bolter? Yes, it is. Hi. How you doing? Glad to have you on. I really Thank look forward. Yeah, l- look forward to talking about uh, Egypt, and I see you did write a book on feminine consciousness. We'll definitely talk about that, and also the uh, problems with the educational curriculum, because that's what Interactive View is about to some degree. But um, first, I guess we might as well start talking about um, Egypt. Uh, you said there is a uh, Pyramid Code 2 that's coming out. Why don't you start off by familiarizing with the listeners with what that's all about? Well, I've been asked to do another series, and I've decided that the only way to go is to crowdfund it through Indiegogo, and that's because I did have some networks approach me, and we worked in weekly conference calls for six months, and at the end of me rewriting the script four times, they totally changed it, made everything false, Disneyland fictional, and uh, wanted me to illustrate it, but there was nothing real about it, so they had to get a caricature of it, and they changed the name to The Watchers, which has nothing to do with the Pyramid Code. So the only way to really come out with something that's true is to do it myself, and the truth of the matter is that I've only gotten 20% of what I paid to do the Pyramid Code by myself the first time, so I'm going to ask people to support it. Okay, a question about the Pyramid Code it's a tough question to ask, but but it's a fair question. I've watched that documentary several times. It, w- it was fascinating, to say the least. But it's one of those things that people can't help but wonder, how did this get on television? Because TV is designed for brainwashing. They don't want people to know that ancient Egypt's history is nothing like what it's like. They don't want people to know that the ancients ha- uh, were able to get into higher states of consciousness, as you stressed in that documentary. So it's a fair question. How in the world did this documentary get on television? Well, it's interesting because it was renewed. It was on Documentary Channel, and it was nominated for Documentary of the Year, and then they renewed it. But it's also been on national TV in 38 countries. But when I first got my agent in New York, he said that the episodes would be worth about $160,000 every time, no, to air repeatedly, and 60000 each episode to air once. And he turned around and sold them for like $1,000 each. So anybody who was looking for programming dirt cheap took it. But he never indicated to me that he was selling it for that small percentage. So the other thing with Netflix, if 10,000 people a day watch it, I get $1, not $1 each, $1. So I think everybody's looking for a bargain, and he sold it out. Okay. okay. Um, I I would like to get right into Egypt now. One thing that I remember in the Pyramid Code documentary, John Anthony West uh, frequently appeared there. He um, actually said that there is an artifact that mainstream science utilizes, which says that Egypt, ancient Egypt, is much older than what mainstream science says it is. Now, I think we might as well get this out right now so um, we can tell mainstream science, like, right in their face, okay, you're lying to us. Why are you uh, have this artifact which says something that you flat out, flat out uh, say? I mean... It, it totally contradicts, makes no sense. Well, it's not supposed to because they're trying to hide the truth from us. But but my point is this this artifact that John Anthony West was talking about, do you know off the top of your head what artifact is so people can relate to that? Yes, it's called the Turin Papyrus. Well, the thing is is that uh, tra- uh, hieroglyphic has been translated incorrectly. Even Champollion, Mignot, who translated the Rosetta Stone that has hieroglyphic, Greek, and Demotic writing on it, he was hesitant before he published, and he was pushed by the old boys club at the time of, you know, Darwin and Freud and all that to to put it out incorrectly. So when it comes time to interpreting uh, anything that is hieroglyphic, it's up to controversy. So I even went to the French Institute with Robert Beauval to meet with the director, and Champollion's bust is right at the door because he came from France. And uh, she said, oh, well, our our official translator isn't here right now. And she pulled books off. We had something that we wanted to to get uh, translated and get confirmed. And she didn't even know what uh, kingdom it came from, new, middle, old. And so I realized 
thinking about it, that no one really knows how to interpret uh, hieroglyphic and they come out with their own interpretations and then they make an official story, which is similar to the narrative that you get on mainstream television and then they repeat it, repeat it, and repeat it. So I don't think anyone really knows how to read the hieroglyphic and now there's new information about uh, the electric universe and how, and, and Laird Scranton is onto this as well with the Dogon tradition, but how all the symbolism symbolism in ancient Egypt is multi-dimensional, multi-layered, and multi-meaning. But it has nothing to do with this is an A and this is a B, because there's 26 letters in the English alphabet and there's 4,000 hieroglyphic. So it's just more evidence of how our society decided on the narrative and is shoving it down our throat. That doesn't mean that what the Egyptians left us doesn't say something else. Okay, a uh, little bit of a side issue here before we get back to Egypt. Um, I talked about this in great detail with uh, Michael Cremo, best known as the uh, author of Forbidden Archaeology and, and whatnot, um, about how what we can do to, to get the uh, truth out that we're being lied to. Uh, two good examples I'd like to give here. Uh, I saw a documentary on YouTube where some guy was talking about how he and his daughter were in a museum and and the the daughter asked the uh, museum guide, how do you date the fossils? And the um, guy said, well, my dear, we date the fossils by the rock layers that they are in. About half an hour later, the girl asked, how do you date the rocks? And the man said, oh, we date the rocks by the age of the fossils that are in those rock layers. And it, like um, in no time, the girl said, wait, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, could you please explain to me why you just made said something that makes absolutely no sense? And well, the guy admitted, I, I know that what I just said doesn't make any sense, but I can't acknowledge the truth because if I did, I would lose my job. And don't even get me started on what well, I'm going to say. Make this quick. But documentary on the UFO TV Studios YouTube channel, New History of Early Man, talks about how there's evidence for humans in the North American continent 250,000 years ago, long before mainstream science says it. And um, the woman, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, who – uh, who found all the evidence for that. She was like the only one who went against mainstream science and said this, and she lost her job. Now, Carmen, this is a big deal. Um, we need to address the issue, I think, that people who go against mainstream science by speaking the truth lose their jobs. Could you perhaps, uh, as someone who knows that mainstream science or has found the evidence, I should say, that mainstream science is lying about things like Egypt's age, how do you propose we solve this problem? Well, it's a big issue, and that's why I didn't end up doing my PhD in archaeology, because I knew that I wouldn't be able to say anything different than the, the, the rhetoric that they put out, so I did it in computational linguistics. Um, there's different dating techniques, and uh, they're mostly wrong. Uh, so carbon-14 dating is pretty good, plus or minus three years, if you're dating some organic material from a fire that was 100 years ago. But once you get into... 10,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, then it's plus or minus 5,000 years or 10,000 years. So it's completely erroneous, but the other thing is you can contaminate it. So even if you're really dating some natural materials, um, we need new techniques. So I was at a conference in Portland with Zachariah Sitchin in uh, 1996, and I got invited to the round table of, um, of archaeologists and scientists, and they started talking about different uh, dating techniques, one being thermoluminescent, one being photoluminescent, and these are the ones that can date all the way back to a million years. So Klaus Donna told me a story about taking um, a piece of a, a skeleton from a giant, actually, and he put it to the lab uh, from Ecuador, and I think it was Ecuador, but it was South America, and they kept it for over a year, and then they said, we're not going to charge you for this, and the date is 5,800 years, and he thought it was more like a million and what's true is nothing is allowed to be older than 6,000 years. So if it is, then the scientists could lose their job if they tell you the right date. So we really have a problem, and so we have to, you know, find ways around it, and, um, and we're doing that. Okay, and since you mentioned his name, I got to talk about this now, because if I don't, I'm going to have it hanging over my head. You said you went... Uh, to, to, with Zachariah Sitchin, um, well, that's significant because he has come up in conversation on my show many times because I would like to lay silence the critics right now. And Carmen, I need you to give me, I'll try to limit this to like two and a half minutes at most, but I said it again. I'm like preaching to the choir, my listeners, but this is critical. 
Zachariah Sitchin's first three books, including his second book, well, yeah, of course, the second book, Stairway to Heaven. I just finished reading it yesterday, coincidentally. Um, his first three books are extremely accurate. How do we know that? Well, I listened to an interview um, with Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartsis, and notice I said Akashic Records reader. If you can read the Akashic Records, then, well, you basically have the ability to answer any question. He said that Sitchin's first three books are very accurate, although he did say that the, uh, well, well, first of all, the significance is that are, are, are huge. One, there is a planet Nibiru in that uh, solar 3600 year orbit, and two, the Anunnaki come from there, and three, they did genetically engineer humans um, about 300,000 years ago by combining human DNA with Anunnaki. Anunnaki DNA. Um, first of all, let me say that how can the Anunnaki survive on Nibiru when it's so far from the sun? People say, well, we've been lied to about how stars work. In my interview with John Lear, we talked about how um, every planet has its own filtering system, which allows for life to exist. So that's how the Anunnaki can survive on Nibiru. Um, but the thing is, there was a lot of um, stuff about Zachariah Sitchin being a CIA and Illuminati disinfo agent. And um, I realized that. And when I, I asked Andrew Bartzis when I met him, could you please explain to me how Sitchin's uh, first three books could have been accurate or how he could have been accurate if he was a disinformer. And Andrew Bartzis told me something that, that's going to blow your mind. He said that all those people that said that Zachariah Sitchin was a fraud, they were actually tricked into thinking they were on an alternate timeline by timeline watcher entities who, uh, through sophisticated technology that I don't have the time to explain now, um, they were able to manipulate those people into thinking that they were on an alternate timeline, which caused them to spew out disinfo about Sitchin. They didn't want us to know that his first three books are accurate. And I'm going to mention a few things in his second book because it's very pertinent for this interview. Um, but with that being said, um, can you concur that that the Anunnaki or Sitchin is very right in, in regards to his stuff on ancient Egypt in his second book? Well, I have a problem with this because basically what Sitchin says is unverifiable. And until Mike Heisner came along and he did a PhD in ancient languages, he was able to use corpus linguistics, which is computational linguistics. And as I mentioned, I have a degree in that as well. And he took the Sumerian texts and he put them into the computer. And then he looked at all the places where Anunnaki, Nephilim, Gold, and Nibiru appeared and looked for co-locations where the words were close together. And he didn't find anything. We know that, the, that Sitchin had an office in the Rockefeller Tower, and so center, Rockefeller Center. And so perhaps the first three books were, but who's going to verify it? Because half of the text is here and half of the text is there. But it seems that when he was speaking at the conference, and I did, you know, talk to him about this, that he, people would ask the question, and they'd say, um, He'd say, it's in my book, it's in my book. And he never answered a single question, almost as though his translations were some kind of a formula and he couldn't remember. So I, I looked at the notion of how people just take fiction whole and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And so nothing that we can say, something has to be verifiable. You can't just talk through your hat and say, it's true because I said so, I know because I'm at the front of the room and you're sitting down so you don't know. So we have to be really careful here. And I also have issues with the idea that, you know, we were enslaved 450,000 years ago, and some people say that Anki was actually 450,000 years old, but yet we have problems with Moses being 900 years old. That's a pretty long run for a human body, or even an extraterrestrial body, for a body at all. So I question what it ends up looking like, because we're enslaved now, but I think that the Sitchin thing has the side effect of making us think, well, we were enslaved then, then and now we're free. So we have to verify all this information. It has to come from more than one place. So that is my take on it after, you know, looking long and hard around corners and trying to figure it out. And I don't know if that sits right with you. But if he wrote more than three books, maybe the first three were right, and then he got co-opted. Well, well actually, it's, to uh, me, it's a red flag. Well, here's the deal. Andrew Bartzis did explain that, there are many timelines coming together on Earth, and Sitchin screwed up the timelines, as he said, from his fourth book onward, which caused them to be more inaccurate than the first three. He also said that Sitchin was wrong about the reason the Anunnaki wanted the gold. It was not to shield the atmosphere of Nibiru. It was to uh, lure entities to Earth, and the Anunnaki themselves, they were lured to Earth by other entities. They did not come there on a mission, and he also said that they came to Earth 480,000 years ago and not 450,000 years ago, and that well, was another example where Sitchin screwed up the timelines. He also said Sitchin was a very spiritual man, and he had a higher dimensional entity helping him write his work. Make of that whatever you will. But maybe we'll get back to this subject in a little bit. 
Um, oh, one more quick thing. Jim Mars in his book, Our Occulted History, he did. He is a Sitchin supporter. He did talk about how Michael Heiser, as you mentioned earlier, he said that he is funded by Illuminati sources. So, But you know what? I don't think we need to debate this any further. There's more important issues to talk about here. One of them is the Great Pyramid. Now, before I get, get into some of the alternate theories about Great Pyramid, the, what the pyramids were used for, um, could you please tell the listeners what you believe the pyramids were used for based on what the Pyramid Code documentaries showed with them like being like beacons of sorts? Well, again, everything in Egypt is multi-layered and existed over a long, long period of time, and so we were used for different purposes. But certainly they're not tombs. And one of the things that I stumbled upon recently in, in, as an insight is that when they were used as initiation chambers and one initiate would go into the uh, sarcophagus inside the so-called king's chamber at a time, if they, they were laying in the right direction, their pineal gland uh, would be exactly at the focal point of the energy of the pyramid and they would practice out-of-body experiences to, and because the trick was to return. Leaving was the easy part. And when the scribes were in there taking records of what was going on in these initiation ceremonies, it looked like the that the person in there wasn't breathing very much. And they used a word called the deceased. And that's where people got the idea that the pyramids were tombs. But what they meant by that, this is again a mistranslation, which is why linguistics is such an important aspect of this, that basically they were saying the body looked dead because they weren't breathing because they weren't in their bodies anymore. So it's my conviction that the energetic fields inside the Great Pyramid uh, do something for the human body, but also they are perfect rep uh, representations of the body, the planet, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe, because all of these fit together in terms of the sacred geometry and how they're constructed. And so they're doing something to help stabilize the planet. The, the, the key to it is the quartz crystal under pressure, so the double helix is giving off an energy. The granite uh, is a slightly radioactive stone, and so they were very definitely helping the Egyptians, the, the high-level initiates, uh, understand what, went, what was beyond in, the, in cosmology, what was beyond this planet, this physical incarnation, so that when they passed, because they didn't have a word for death, they knew what to do and what to expect on the other side. Yeah, and uh, let me tell you what George Kavaslis told me in my interview with him. Um, he told me that the Great Pyramids, and he said he lived a past life where he was a member of the people who did this. The Great Pyra the Pyramids of Giza, the three of them that line up like Orion's belt, um, well, actually, for, let me start off by saying that Andrew Collins, he and his um, documentary, The Sickness Mystery, and he wrote a book by the same name, talks about how he believes the Great Pyramids line up with the constellation of Cygnus, the swan, and not Orion's belt like uh, Robert Brevala and others have, most of them have asserted. And also Lisa Renee in one of a presentation that, that I saw her do at the same Metaphysics and Consciousness Conference that I met Andrew Bartzis at, um, she said that the pyramids were meant to represent the Sirius um, star system. But when I talked to George Kavaslis about this and asked him, how do you know that it was Orion? Because he said it was Orion, and he claimed that the pyramids were brought to Earth to anchor the male energy, because Orion is a male energy area, dominant area of the sky. The pyramids were designed to uh, anchor the male energy, and it kind of makes sense, because in an episode of Ancient Aliens, they talked about this guy that I think he spun a pyramid or something, and it pointed to the constellation of Orion. So I subscribe to that, too, and that kind of makes sense. And George Kavaslis, he told me, that the pyramids, aside from being anchored, uh, put to earth to anchor the male energy, he had a, the, the chance to experience what, what that sarcophagus thing in the Great Pyramid. It's not a sarcophagus. What happens is a human would lie in there, and the four corners of the pyramid represent the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. And the human who was lying in the sarcophagus got to feel those energies, and then the energies um, would shoot up the top of the pyramid where the capstone, which is now missing, was. Um, and you, I guess you get to feel the energy in, in the universe um, after it shoots out the capstone. Um, with that being said, do you think there may be some truth to all this? Okay, now that's a lot of names, and I know all these people's work, and uh, anybody can say anything, and again, what's verifiable? Now, what I've done is I've gone into Starry Night Pro and spent several months looking at the different star systems that could be coordinated with what I call the Band of Peace, going from Abu Rausch and six sites that go all the way to Dashur, and I took various star systems and then I ran a movie back and I lined them up with Google Earth 
and then I ran, um, uh, you, can, you can record it, 50,000 years back and then up to 13,500 AD. And, and I was looking for the star systems that held together within that, and it's the extragalactic grid. Now, Walter Crittenden talks about Sirius uh, possibly being a binary star system with the Earth, and so I um, speculated, again, it's always a hypothesis until there's something to verify it, that Abu Rausch to the north of the Great Pyramid and the Giza Plateau was Cygnus. And then Orion, I tested it, and that Abu Sir, Robert Baval says this in the Pyramid Code, that there's a scattering of seven pyramids and that fit with um, uh, the Pleiades, and uh, then I couldn't figure out which one, and I didn't publish this because I don't know what uh, Saqqara is, but that um, uh, the red pyramid at Dashur and the, and the three pyramids there uh, were Cygnus. Now, Andrew Collins says everything is Cygnus, sorry, but uh, Gobleki Tepe and everything, and so actually if we're looking at the entirety of the pyramid fields, uh, within a 20-mile uh, radius here, up and down, uh, Cygnus is Abu Rausch. Orion seems to be Giza. Uh, Abu Sir is the Pleiades, and uh, Dashur is Cygnus. This lines up, and that, whenever I put something in that isn't one of those, that I tried many, many things, at least 10 constellations for um, uh, Saqqara, as you run it back, it flips out of the orbit. And so when, and I've always wondered why Isis had a bird on her head, and so Cygnus, it goes right through the tail of the swan and straight out the nose. Um, and so if you keep going, the next thing is the galactic center, which is what we came into alignment with December 21st, 2012, and then it comes back around to Sirius. Now, Sirius stays in the center of this extra galactic grid the entire time. So there's something about the bird being on her head that completes this circle. So I'm pretty sure from a scientific standpoint of what I'm saying there. Okay, and uh, by somewhat fitting coincidence, yesterday I was listening to a radio interview that Andrew Bartzis did with Laura Uplinger to talk about the Divine Feminine. I figured I probably should listen to that because we're going to be talking about feminine consciousness as a primer. Coincidentally, in that um, talk, Andrew Bartzis said, well, actually, it's interesting. He said, I believe the pyramid. I mean, if you can access the Akashic Records, why would he say, I believe? It's an interesting question. But he said, I believe the Great Pyramid was built... 803,000 years ago. Now, this seems to fly in the face of uh, Robert Buval saying that the pyramids were built in conjunction with the uh, alignment of the um, Orion's belt and also the uh, Sphinx representing Leo in around 10,500 BC. But one has to think, well, maybe is it possible that, the, that when they built the pyramids here 803,000 years ago, which is uh, like, yeah, there's been many falls and rises of Atlantis and Lemuria. Andrew Bartis has said there wasn't just one land, Atlantis and Lemuria. They all existed throughout time. And even Michael Cremo um, said that that makes sense because the Vedic text uh, would suggest that humanity is much, much older than even Zachariah Sitchin says because um, like cycles of time are always being reborn and all. But the point, the, the point here is 803,000 years ago, maybe they did know that the pyramids and the Sphinx would align at that time in 10,500 BC, so maybe that and everything before was planted ahead. I understand we're going off into the deep end here, but could you maybe suggest, hey, maybe there's some truth to the 800,000 years ago Great Pyramid was put, built then theory? Okay, so we are off in the deep end, and I'm coming here having listened to every uh, minute twice of the Andrew Bartis uh, series with Lance White. And I did meet George Kabopoulos and uh, go to a seminar of his, and so I'm familiar with their work. There's no question that I've been following all these people that you're mentioning. And so we have to ground this stuff to something. And um, the processional cycle, if you're, if you're going with what Robert Baval says about 10,500 years and the processional cycle is 26,000 years, then add 26 to that, add 26 to that, it would seem that it has to align to something. And so the date could be, you know, 39,000 years or 52,000 years. But coming back to what you said, that the pyramid was to ground the male energy. Well, what we have for the last 5,000 years is clearly a patriarchy. But what we're, they're trying to say with the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki and Sitchin's work is that it's always been patriarchal. They only talk about the male gods. They don't talk about Anana, who's in my book, who's the feminine goddess. 
And but it works for patriarchy now. You have to understand that we're just absolutely, you know, stuck inside disconnect, disconnect, power over hierarchy. And they're trying to tell us that all we've ever had is patriarchy. And I say once we get through all this, we're going to see this last 5,000 year period as the patriarchal hiccup. Now here's a case in point. I spoke at the Hidden Mysteries conference uh, at the Bosnian Pyramids a year ago, not this just recently, and um, I was talking to Dr. Sam and Timothy Moon and visited their um, their museum. They call it a lab, actually. And uh, I saw the certificate, uh, the dating certificate using carbon-14 that came out of a lab with organic material that they found between the third and fourth course on the exterior of the pyramid. And the date, and again, it's likely erroneous based on it being slightly younger. It's like the, we have to keep testing this. But the date came back, Andrew, at 38 thousand years. Now, what's absolutely jaw-dropping for me is that the matriarchal cultures were happening there. And so Angels and Archetypes, an Evolutionary Map of Feminine Consciousness has 10 years of research in it. That's my book. And it's really looking at what the, the, the research question was, what happened in matriarchy that gave way to patriarchy? And that's a very complex question. But pretty much everything before the first dynasty of Egypt, which corresponds to the beginning of the patriarchy, 3113 BC, was matriarchal. Now, based on all that work, based on the runes that are part of my book, um, there is a and in the Bosnian pyramids they were decommissioned, as was Gobleki Tepe in Turkey, which is almost certainly matriarchal. And Klaus Schmidt would say, "We don't know, we don't know, I don't know why we they find circular things. I don't know why we find spirals, why we find red, white, and black." And the answer to all of that is matriarchal. And so it makes sense that a lot of these people that you're talking about are men, and they would look at it from a male perspective. And the agenda of the patriarchy is to raise evidence of everything other than itself. But what we see inside this this lab, and I, I, I have HD footage of it, and I also went down to South Africa, uh, the invitation of Michael Tillinger, and inside his museum, I've also got footage. If you were to look at these two sets of footage, you would think it's the same place. So the stone artifacts that they're finding are similar. And Bosnia and South Africa, are in, they're not walking distance. They're nowhere in the same vicinity. So it seems that there was a unified worldwide culture that, that was stone-based. But what this, and, and, and uh, Timothy Moon showed me this, because look what I found yesterday. I've got him on film. And he said, you know, I found this yesterday. I called her Medusa. Well, Medusa happens to be the chapter in my book that is looking at the switchover between matriarchy and patriarchy. And the other thing he says, it's a left-handed culture. If you hold these artifacts in your right hand, and they used to hold these little uh, dolls or whatever, goddess figures, and they found many, many, many all at the same time in Maria Gambutis' work and all over the world. And so left-handed culture means matriarchal. That time frame means, means matriarchal. And because of school, government, religion, we're not supposed to think beyond 6,000 years, so we don't have the mind map that will even allow us to go far that far back. But my point here is that pyramid power seems to be needing megalithic stone structures and, and feminine consciousness. So we need to fit all these things. I mean, you could just sit there and listen to all these people and, and just your mind will shatter because there's so many different ideas. Based on what? Based on I channeled it? Okay, I call channeling and, and, and past life memory a hypothesis, but then you have to go into the field and check it out. So thinking and, and thinking something is so is fantastic as a starting point, but you need research to back it up. You sure do. I mean, a lot of uh, people like talk about past lives and ET contacts and all. I feel you got to listen to them and maybe put it in the back of your uh maybe in your gray basket, and then when some uh, true evidence uh, comes out uh, uh, that's definitive, more definitive, you can say, well, uh, that shows that those contacts, maybe it's a good thing I listened to them and kept what they said in mind. So that's the way I look at it. People might beg to differ on that subject. But um, the uh, Sphinx, let's talk about that. Contradictions about the Sphinx. Some say it's a lion. Some say it's a dog, or more specifically, a jackal. And um, on the uh, most re recent episode of Ancient Aliens, it was about the Sphinx, uh, for those people that uh, didn't watch that episode. Um, they, I don't remember the guy's name, but he said back in the 
old times, the Sphinx had the head of Anubis, the desert uh, jackal god. And uh, at some point, they decided to cut it into a human head. Uh, is it a dog uh, or a lion or a jackal? What do you have to say about this subject? Okay, well, first of all, Ancient Aliens is on television. They've asked me to be on a few times, and they have a three-day production time for each episode. They have a different producer for every episode, and everything goes to Aliens. And so the thing is is that I don't know that you put too much credibility. I don't want to put too much credibility because anyone can say anything, and they do. So again, what's the evidence? What, where does it sit? Now, Hakim in the Pyramid Code calls her Tefnuti. And that is a feminine goddess. Now, when I, the first day I met Hakeem, and I studied with him for 10 years, um, he said the Sphinx is feminine. Well, I knew that as well. And it could easily be that the head was carved differently. But the Sphinx itself is an anomaly. Now, I have spent a lot of time inside the Sphinx, inside the body of the Sphinx, by myself. And every time I did that, like I spent five years on the plateau when it was closed, before the wall went up. You know, I've been at this since 77. That was the first time I went to, to Egypt. And I used to live in Egypt, and I had it arranged where the, the watchmen on the plateau knew me, and I would go on at sunset when it closed, and I'd be in and out of the holes, and I had friends who connected me and let me get inside the body of the Sphinx. So to me, it is an amazing anomaly, and every time I came out of there, I would not sleep for 72 hours. Never once did I sleep for 72 hours after I was inside the Sphinx. And so there are four cavities, um, and most of them were covered up by the um, recent restoration. And, uh, but, and now they've changed everything inside. Um, the last time I was in there, it's like they've covered it all up. They've covered up uh, what the original energy was. But the first time I was in the, the cavity on the, rump, the back rump of the Sphinx, it was like these swirling wormholes, very uh, intense energy that was spiral. But I've also been interested in what is on the left side and what were they talking about with this cavity and all of that. So there's, I got a big file on the Sphinx. But um, you can say it used to be this. What, what do you have to verify it? And are you just trying to um, prove a theory that you made up? Like how do you justify that? And, and I, I really think that it's feminine because of the time frame. You've got to remember the patriarchy is recent. Right, right. Uh, I want to get back to uh, the pyramid for a moment. I forgot to mention uh, Christopher Dunn's theory about how uh, in one shaft you put um, uh, dilute a hydrochloric acid solution, and then in the other shaft you put uh, hydro, hydro, hydrodized, uh, whatever the word is I'm looking for, zinc, and you um, they, they will combine in the king's chamber, and um, some... Uh, um, resonators that are planted throughout the pyramid will vibrate and cause the um, pyramid to act as a power plant in conjunction with the uh, hydrodized zinc and the uh, hydrochloric acid solution coming together to form hydrogen. Uh, this was discussed on an episode of Ancient Aliens. Um, now this raises this and all the other theories I talked about. Kavasil saying the four elements you feel them when you're in the sarcophagus, and what you said in the pyramid code about the pyramids acting as beacons and all. I mean, this raises the question: Is it possible that the pyramids could have had multiple uses at once? And that may well, well that brings up a whole new can of worms. So the idea of Christopher Dunn's theory and the whole idea of the pyramids could have been used for all these things at the same time. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think that they could have been used for all these different things, perhaps not at the same time. So you're not going to be running chemicals through it when the initiates are in the sarcophagus. But there are uh, weird chemical marks, um, and there are in the Pyramid of Dashur as well. I happen to think that Chris Dunn is coming, approaching it from a, a, a very scientific standpoint because he's an engineer. So he's not trying to say, you know, it's spiritual, it's channeled, it's this or that. He's just looking at the hard facts of the rocks themselves, and the, the, the measurements, and I, it fits comfortably with me. But the idea that, that water um, could be blown apart and the hydrogen and the oxygen could be split and the hydrogen could be harnessed for a source of passive power, implosion power instead of explosion power, makes a lot of sense to me, not just because Chris Dunn said it, um, but I think that he's, he's done some really interesting work. Now, the whole idea of the zigzag patterns of the honeycomb um, underneath in the passageways underneath the Great Pyramid. See, this also fits with the passageways underneath the Bosnian Pyramid. 
and the water, the, 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 the Nile used to run right in front of the feet of the Sphinx, right along the plateau. And so at a certain time of year, the Nile would flood and then it turned into this whole chemical thing. But maybe at other times of year, they were using the, the passageways for other things. So I'm pretty sure that, um, that there were initiation chambers underneath the plateau. They used the initiation chamber in the pyramid. But they we're talking about thousands and thousands of years. But everything on the plateau and on the band of peace was resonant. Resonance, crystal energy, sound and light technology. And it's hard for us to conceive of what I call fields within fields within fields. And so we are made out of 70 plus percent water. And the transmutation of the atom is where the cities and the abilities come from, S-I-D-H-I-S, which is teleportation, telepathy, transmutation, bilocation, alchemy, and manifestation. These, once the initiates, Raise a certain, were at a certain vibrational level and levels of consciousness, they were able to do this that, 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 that was about bringing energy, bringing something and manifesting it from another dimension, taking their ka body double and still staying in the present and having their body double be somewhere else. This is all over the temple walls, but most people don't know how to interpret it. And, um, I mean, I could show you evidence of all of this. So... I think that a lot of things went on in the pyramid, but not all at the same time, and that they're very, very old. Yes, much older than we are told. Um, one, get, Now back to the Sphinx. Uh, what do you have to say about Edgar Cayce's um, claim that uh, evidence of Atlantis exists under the Sphinx's paw? Well, I mean, again, these are big questions, and I chased around for, you know, 10 years trying to see. But when they say, ben, be, what does it to say, under the paw of the Sphinx, what if we change that word to beneath, beneath and in front of? Because I looked for 10 years for this place that I remembered, and I was doing, I'm getting warm, I'm getting cool. But I was like, nope, 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 until I found it. And that was uh, chambers inside the Sphinx temple. And, of course, that's one of the most restricted areas on the planet, literally. And, uh, you know, I slid down a sand dune and, and got in there, kicked off my shoes, and, and that's just a habit because the high-level, I found out much, much later that high-level initiates never wore shoes in the temples. They were always bare feet. And when I got in there, I was like, oh, yeah, this is it. And then it started to run like a movie. I could smell the flowers, see the priestesses in their white robes. And I went in there and I looked and I thought, oh, there's a wall. But behind that wall there's a passageway. Well, that passageway goes right underneath the left paw of the Sphinx, continues into the initiation chambers of the second pyramid, which is where those high-level initiations were happening because the initiates could be trained into eight levels of initiation. This is my understanding. But they needed to be supercharged um, by the high, high priestess to move to the ninth. And once they did that, they had all those abilities that I mentioned a minute ago, or they, they, they would come quite quickly after that. So there are passageways under that, but there was also a temple of Isis to the left of the Sphinx, and Zahi arranged to get that all covered in cement, and so we'll never really find them. But I'm telling you, I was really interested in what was in those passageways, and I had a vision of you know what I was looking for, and I have just recently realized that it's not under the Giza Plateau, it's somewhere else, but now I think I've identified where it is. And so... Edgar Casey again, like, you can't say anybody's 100% right. So he gave us a lot of interesting, wonderful things. And, and it's always going to be a little turn of phrase, in instead of on, or some little thing. And just like, um, um, now I'm forgetting his name, but the, the uh, oh, come on. Anyway, the, everybody, you know, some people are, are right for a while, and then they're not so right after. And so um, there's something down there. But when Joseph Shore and that team went and did the testing, they actually had a sledgehammer on a metal plate. I don't think that's sophisticated enough. And then they would read the metal plate and say that there was some kind of a cavity and they, they veined the shape of it. No matter what, a sledgehammer and a metal plate with a lever isn't going to give you the exact dimension. So there's something down there, but I think it's been misinterpreted. Now, when you want to talk about Atlantis, Let's talk about the third party hypothesis because the Mayans, you know, East Indian, lots of people talk about the same sorts of things, but it doesn't seem plausible that they were talking to each other. So what if there was a tremendous sophistication in Atlantis and they knew there was already two catastrophes, a third catastrophe was coming, they had the ability to um, 
prophesied that the, the thing was coming and that there were evacuation committees in Atlantis. I happen to remember this from my past life memories and that they left in fleets of boats that had salination, they had, you know, plants, fruits and vegetables, and they went around the world to build pyramids, straight-sided pyramids, to stabilize the planet. And so they colonized, some of them went back to Atlantis, the continent, you know, I think it was a worldwide seafaring culture. And uh, so the evidence of Atlantis is the plateau. Okay, in regards to Atlantis, um, a lot of people seem to have changed their opinions on w when the pyramids were built. You can understand why we kind of did that earlier, but one good example, I remember in the late 90s, uh, a presentation David Icke gave, he said uh, pyramids uh, were built around 3000 BC, and then like maybe a decade later in one of his nine-hour talks, he actually said, I am starting to think that these, uh, that the Giza complex was actually an outpost beacon of sorts, if you will, for uh Atlantis and maybe Lemuria. And in that case, he would be referring to the most recent Atlantis, the one around 10,500 BC. So do you think maybe there is truth to that, that it was some sort of an outpost or a, a hot spot or a remote hot spot that uh, Atlantis would utilize? Well, perhaps we are too obsessed with the date. And people say, well, who built the pyramid? So what if I said it was Mr. and Mrs. Poseidon who hired the ABC construction company in, you know, 12,602 BC. Does that really help you understand what they're for? Like we're obsessed with the who did it, when did they do it, what did they do, and even with the legal system or the injustice system, somebody has to be guilty, somebody has to be accused, and then they close the case. Does that mean they're right? No. And, you know, lots of people have changed dates and changed their mind. And so we come out definitively and say it was built in this date. And then we come back and change our mind and say, okay, it was built in this date. We're afraid because TV says it is, this is so, and it's true. Now, when you do a PhD, they teach you to hedge. It, from the data we have now, it could be, it seems like. And so we fall into the patterns of teaching, you know, the, or speaking the way we were taught, and it's part of the patriarchy, patri PBS network, patriarchal bullshit, that we have to be sure about something. Because with the PhD, in 20 years, if something new gets discovered, your dissertation is still in pu pu published. And so you need to say, from what we know now, it looks like, and nobody knows how old the pyramids are, but I don't know if deciding how old they are is really helpful. But for sure, they weren't built in 2450 BC. The last work was done on them then. They're far, far more ancient, which is why it's so difficult for us to put it into perspective, because 2450 BC in relative terms is not that long ago. Yes, uh, I want to ask you one hard to ask question, but it's a fair question again, this time about the Pyramid Code documentary series in general. Um, one thing that I and probably a lot of other people were scratching their heads over after watching that documentary, all five parts of it, there was, I mean, you talked a lot about the um, people of ancient Egypt per perhaps attaining higher states of consciousness, but once was there ever any mention or the idea of extraterrestrial involvement. Um, for all the people that are scratching their heads on that one, could you perhaps uh, give an answer to that question, why the Pyramid Code never mentioned ETs or the theory of it? Well, shortly after the Pyramid Code came out, I was asked to write a book called Aliens in Ancient Egypt. And uh, it was with a co-writer, and I caught him plagiarizing, and so reported that to the publishers, and the book got cancelled. Um, so it's not that the... The thing is, is that we... It's the way we think about it. Like the, this business of extraterrestrials coming in their spaceships is like us in our cars. We all have vehicles, but the idea of of a, a higher consciousness coming and talking to us or visiting us was very um, familiar to the ancient Egyptians. And so the idea that they came and they built it for us is kind of like giving our power away. And so Hakim was adamant that even if there was help from other planets, which was normal to the ancient Egyptians in terms of energy, like we're channeling something or getting strength from something or getting ideas from something, the, the Egyptians themselves almost certainly would have had a hand in building the pyramids. So the high-level initiates were super sophisticated, highly refined, had great abilities. They were working with anti-gravity and all of that, and they were physically here. They built the pyramids. Now, maybe they had 
technology that they learned about from other places. But again, it's unverifiable to say aliens did it. How do you know which alien, where'd they come from, what's their picture like? And so I just didn't want to get into that. However, if you look at all of the distended skulls, Nefertiti and McNaughton, two belly buttons, um, you know, like all these different things that you see in artifacts in the museums, they were obviously a race of their own. And of course, that's minimized, but, and you know, th there's so many mistakes in, in ancient Egypt. We're all so curious. We all want to know what happened. But if you, if you spend as much time as I've had reading all the ancient texts, I mean, it'll just spin your head. And there's a lot of repeated stuff. So I'm not going to, okay, we're talking about Sirius and all these different planetary systems. I mean, it, it, personally, it's my conviction that we are all starseed. We've all come from other places. But there's so much misinformation about aliens and so much controversy and conspiracy theory, all that, that it's a red herring. But whatever it is that we've all come to think about as aliens, I think that there's a lot more to it than that. And they're not all negative and the grays and all of that. I mean, but again, it's unverifiable. So what I was trying to do in the Pyramid Code is do, give you something that was concrete. And I cannot concretize aliens. I've never met one. And uh, so it's, I'm not, not open to it, but it's also not fair to think that aliens built the pyramids and they had their spaceship and they moved the rocks around. I think it's far more sophisticated than that. It also take, gives our power to them because we need to be empowered. And I think that, you know, we had abilities that we can get back because they have the same DNA as we do. It doesn't mean I don't think we're not starseeds. We are starseeds. We are indeed starseeds. Uh uh, in regards to the Great Pyramids, uh, this is going off into the deep end here again. Uh, Richard Hoagland and his work on Cydonia. It does appear that there are pyramids on Mars. And um, he did, in one of his presentations, um, show that the face on Mars, if you – some trick of the lighting or whatever, I don't know exactly what he did. But after he did it, it did appear to show the face of a lion. And in my interview with the whistleblower Andrew Bishago, he was in the government Mars space program. He said, yeah, Mars is nothing like what we're told. It's like the sky is a baby blue color. It's not the, the surface is not the red color we're told. It actually looks like the desert of Arizona. You can survive on Mars with, without a spacesuit, although breathing would be a lot harder and you would have pain in your muscles because there's not uh, the same amount of oxygen. Um, and there are ETs on Mars and there was a cataclysm, a solar system cataclysm, which I guess coincided with the fall of Atlantis around 10,500 BC, changed the layout of the solar system. And that um, is basically what put Mars in a coma. Andrew Bartis has said Mars, for all intents and purposes, is a planet in a coma. So would you, are you open to the possibility of there being a connection between the pyramids and face on Mars and the pyramids and Sphinx on Giza? Yes, and there are pyramids up there. Look at all of what we're told is scrambled and misinformation. So people come and they're sure about something and they say something, and we still don't have a full deck about what's going on out there. So again, I don't want to go out on a limb and say something is or something isn't. But uh, from what you can see from photographs, it seems that there are pyramids anchoring star systems and other things that are in, in similar um, configurations. But until you and I go to Mars and see it for ourselves or get close and get the pictures that aren't altered, we can't say for sure. Can we? Uh, no, we can't, unless you're a remote viewer. <laughs> but um, that's No, but even that, I, I had remote viewers say to me, okay, anything you want to check out with the pyramid code, um, you know, ask us any question, and for free we'll put our team to it. And, they, and so, they, of course, it's double blind and they don't tell anybody anything. And then they sent me the reports and they were all over the place. They were all over the place in terms of timelines. Everybody said somebody diff, something different. And I said that back to the project leader and she ended up quitting remote viewing over it. I mean, even that. And even, you know, like somebody who's channeling. Like according to what and how do you know that somebody doesn't somehow, you know, lose their energy field? It's, it's almost like IQ, you know, they tell us in school you're going to take an IQ test and that's your IQ. No, we're smarter some days than others. Our IQ goes up and down. We can do brain exercises, brain aerobics and get smarter. Like all of these things are patriarchal concepts that trip us up in terms of what we can know and not know. And most of these people who are, you know, saying, yes, this is true. What's their background? How do they know? 
they're not really doing research in a way that's replicatable that somebody else can do, go and do exactly what they did and find the same thing. Most of them are speculating. I'm sorry. Yes, but even speculation, even it's good to speculate. I think it's okay to speculate if, they, if the powers that be try to discredit you. Well, that's okay because karma will come back to haunt them for trying to discredit you. But um, before we uh, get on to other subjects, there is a caller in the queue. Um, in the queue, though, it actually says 111111111. Don't know what that's all about, but uh, I guess I'll let this caller on the air. Caller, you are on the air. What's your name? Where's your, where are you from? But what's your question for Carmen? Uh, okay, they hung up. Uh, they could have just stayed on the air, and uh, I would have figured out that they were uh, just listening. But but anyway, let's carry on. You did talk about uh, 2012 in your uh, in the Pyramid Code, and uh, there's uh, different takes on what happened in 2012. Let me give you a couple of uh, those things. Uh, Andrew Bartzis said on t- December 21st, 2012, that was the first time that we all got to experience universal dream time, where um, we basically, when we were in dream time for one brief moment, which we couldn't consciously perceive, we had the ability to choose, are you going to push for higher consciousness and love, or are you going to be a sheeple, if, if, that, if that makes sense. That's what we got to do in universal in, um universal consciousness and we will we we have that every so every um solstice and equinox and i think maybe every full moon too we get to experience universal dream time but december 21st 2012 was the first time that happened also andromeda council contacted tolex said that that was the day that the earth's core blossomed into from a third dimensional into a fourth dimensional um entity the core did and over the course of time uh mother earth the planet well actually the planet is in 4d now but humanity still has some things to do he claims um to be in 4d but that was the day the core went into 4d and jim self in an interview on n5d radio said that december 21st 2012 that's the date where time ceased to exist in the sense that you are free and what he meant by you are free is it doesn't matter what you do the timeline will and the way it's designed to end, no matter what anybody in the timeline tries to do. That doesn't mean we should all sit back and act, act like couch potatoes and think, oh, the Andromedans are going to save us. No, no, we, 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 we still have an obligation to do our part. But um, we are uh, – and that somewhat ties into the, what I interviewed Ray Kusalandich with last week about the consciousness shift in 2017 and also how – the fact that Fukushima is a global extinction event is one of the reasons the ETs want to take us higher consciousness. But anyway, I'm digressing. The point is there are many different things about what happened on December 21st, 2012. I just gave three of them. Uh, Based on on your research, what do you have to say about this subject? Well, first of all, those three things are completely different, unless you want to just lump them all together and say we're moving forward, A. And B, after you know 2012, lots of people were like, I thought things were going to get better. I, I don't see anything different. That's the case in point. C, I had a group of 80 people over there when Egypt was just like empty. And um, we spent the afternoon on December 21st, 2012 at the Crystal Altar. And a lot of things happened. And then we were at sunset. Uh, we were on a rooftop that had been catered and carpets and tables, with tablecloths and everything with a great pyramid right in front of us. And we did a meditation together right at the moment of sunset. And so we were there front row and center. Now, it all depends on people's consciousness. And I have to say, I've erred on the side of thinking that when people come to Egypt with me, that they were high-level initiates and that they would be more conscious than most. And people's level of consciousness, you know, is often compromised because of what they're eating, what they're thinking, belief systems, and basic patriarchy stuff that I keep coming back to, the way our school system teaches us, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so when we were on our way to Abu Ghraib, I was thinking, because I spent a lot of time there, and interestingly that they use the same name for their torture chamber, the jail in this time, so that's one of the most sacred places, and it's got a lot of quartz crystals, and each person ended up lying on the, the circle, which is like six feet around, and then there's more crystal that goes, over. anyway, and so I was, was keeping my eyes out for spaceships, to tell you the truth, and I mentioned that to a couple of people who I knew were pretty tuned in, and uh, this woman came up to me right away and said, I saw them, I saw five of them. Someone else took a picture. They looked at their picture. There was a ship. There were all kinds of turquoise blue light beams, and then there were a whole bunch of out of those 80 people that went, what do you mean? I didn't see anything. So on the way between the two venues that I mentioned, there were two little boys on our trip. One was nine and one was 10. And, um, and I was sitting 
across the aisle on the bus with them. And I said, so, do you know that some people saw some spaceships? And one of them went, oh, come on, there aren't any spaceships. It's the Weedle. And the other little boy, the younger one, said, well, I'm not so sure about that. I think that there could be ships. And, 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 and he's like, it doesn't mean I've seen one, but I'm kind of open to the idea. And the other one, oh, frump, 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 in a typical, you know. Anyway, so, of course, we got to the other venue, and the little boy who was open to it saw something. And the little boy who wasn't open to it didn't see anything. Now, I know that we, and, and, and Starry Night Pro and, you know, the, 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 the whole map of the sky will say that we aligned, the sun aligned exactly with the galactic center. And on December 21st, 2008, imagine a pen across the open part of a glass. And so 2008, the pen was aligned with the edge, and 9, 10, 11, and right to the center, 12. So we've been touching that energy all along, but it was directly aligned. Just the way we have a birthday week nowadays, our birthday is at a specific moment on a specific day, right? And so, but when you're kind of a few days from your birthday, your friends are taking you to lunch and that sort of thing. So I think we've been in the energy of all of these things, when whatever, universal dream time, whatever. But there is so there are so many interference patterns coming from the powers that pretend mind control, why fry I call it, uh, chemtrails, GMO, even, even toxification from grains. People are sick. They're on medication. You know, they're, they're in survival panic. They're, you know, when you're financially stressed, I mean, people probably could be moving into these states of consciousness. However, we're so compromised with systemic distress that I think it's pretty hard for people to even recognize this stuff. What do you think? Well, the way I see it, the people of planet Earth, well, since you ask, um, I might as well tell the honest-to-God truth about how I feel about this. I'm going to say something I've said many times on my show. It gets hard to say it, harder and harder every time to say it, but I'm not going to stop saying it because I feel an obligation to wake up humanity. And the, in regards to the people on planet Earth and what they think and how they feel, I have come to the realization that one of the reasons it's so easy for governments and also mainstream scientists to to keep secrets and get away with their secrets being exposed is because a very significant percentage of the common people who make up the general public on planet Earth are so paradigmatic, so fearful, and so flat out stupid that they will refuse to believe something shocking or disturbing, even if the evidence shows that they have no choice but to believe it. And related to that is the fact that there is a mountain of evidence that ancient Egypt is nothing like what we're told it's like by mainstream science, and yet people are stupid enough to go along with mainstream science. So that's what I think about it. I do apologize to anyone who took offense. I have to apologize every time I say this, but Carmen, since I I've given you my answer. Do you have anything to say about my answer? Yes, I think that the entire system is meant to dumb us down, cut us off, give us misinformation, and confuse us. And uh, Freud's nephew, Berets, coined the phrase um, public relations and said, all you have to do is confuse somebody, tell them something, tell them something the opposite, tell them something again the opposite, and then um, there, there's cognitive dissonance, and then put a product in front of them and they'll buy it. <laughs> so it's like the way that humanity has been compromised on many levels has worked. You know, we can say we're not giving our power away to them, but they have got us, and they are in control. And, 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 and lots of people say, oh, we need to change this and that, and if only we would, you know, stop, you know, war. Well, most people I know don't like war, and people who have been in war aren't running back unless they have to. But it's, it's this monstrous group that, you know, 0-1%, you know, that, that, that are running it all. And I think if they got out of the way, the rest of us would clear, the planet would clear, and we'd figure things out. But it's not, you know, in this whole term, too, of conspiracy theory, that was coined as a term for anybody who doesn't agree with the rhetoric and the narrative and the mainstream media, and they're owned by the cabal. And so we don't really have much of a chance to find what we really think, to get into our true soul's purpose and all of that. And so, you know, what's, you know, socially acceptable standing around the water cooler rocking on your heels is to talk about what you saw on TV. And we know they're not telling the truth. So we're compromised. Right. And, um, 
I have also said that, uh, well, actually, Mark Matika did confirm this in my interview with him. He said that the reason so many humans on planet Earth are paradigmatic, fearful, and stupid is because we were genetically engineered to be paradigmatic, fearful, and stupid by extraterrestrials who wanted to use us as, as a slave species. So they genetically engineered us that way to keep us in line and understand that you would have to study the work of Zachary Sitchin and David Icke. But – Moving on. Not, I don't agree with that at all. I think we have the same DNA, and it's like a muscle. And if we clear ourselves and start to tune in and avoid all these things that, you know, that are that, that are part of the establishment, that we will wake up. We do wake up. But the amount of stuff that comes into us that distracts us from that, and financial distress is one of them, um, we get distracted. Glad you gave your take on that. I'd like to get back to ancient Egypt, uh, specifically with the uh, indigenous wisdom keeper, Iman. Uh, what was his name again? Hakim. Hakim, okay. Uh, Hakim uh, talked about glands, about how the ancient Egyptians understood the uh, the powers of glands in the body. Um, and among other things, he said that the thing that people think is a button on top of a pharaoh's hat, it's not a button, it's a, it's a gland. Uh, why did the ancient Egyptians value glands so much? And which glands, I'm guessing it's the pineal gland and the pituitary gland were the top two, but I could be wrong. Which glands were they most concerned about? Well, each gland corresponds to a chakra. So now through yoga, we're more oriented to the seven chakras. And so, but the glands are the regulators. I mean, we wouldn't be fully human if, we, if our glands didn't, didn't function. But the thymus, uh, which is the button on the head, fits into the, the, the red crown and the white crown, which they made up as upper and lower Egypt, so they could have a war about it, um, really is representing the womb and the thymus that triggers procreation. Uh, the Egyptians were concerned primarily with two things, which is biology, how we got here, and cosmology, what happens when we leave. And so without biology, we don't have much. And so the marriage between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine, all of that was really important. So they keep showing that a man wearing a thymus on his head is basically showing that we, we value procreation. And so it's, it, when we don't understand the Egyptians, we, we make them sound a little silly and stupid that they were obsessed with something that wasn't important. And even they fed the glands through blue lotus and wine and the combination of that. You know, we demonize all these things that produce altered states of consciousness in this culture because they don't want people to wake up. So they make it, you know, illegal and all of that. But, you know, we, we're, our humanity depends on these, these systems working in harmony with one another. And pretty much everything that the pharmaceutical company gives us distorts that, disturbs it, stops it, uh, gives side effects. And so we don't really understand that either because we keep jerking things around inside our metabolic functions and glandular functions that makes us unhealthy. So I think it was a really good thing, and I think they were giving us some very important information about how things work. Right, right. Um, one thing that was also discussed in the Pyramid Code that I would like to um, discuss, the energy orbs that um, – they said in order to see them, you would actually have to be in the uh, pyramid area around uh, – uh, or any hot – like T-Call, there was another place they said that you can see these things at like 3 a.m. in the morning. You would have to be there. I think you would need a camera and put it to some setting. You would be able to see um, – look, look, look like orbs in the air, orbs of energy, and if you were to uh, like – view Mother Earth from above as the daytime is coming shortly before the daylight um, side appears on the Earth, you could see like evidence of these energy orbs. Uh, refresh my memory, if you will, and also enlighten our listeners on what that w was all about. Okay, now, more and more, uh, it was, I've, I've got a file of 80 pictures of these sorts of things. Um, and um, Okay, first of all, if a cam some people will say that they used to be able to take lots of pictures of orbs, but then they got a new camera and it didn't work anymore. What camera companies are doing are putting filters in so you don't see the orbs in some of them. And there's a way that you can take your remote control from your TV and go when you're buying a camera and see. The anyway, that's just a technique. But if you go to the same place, same time, with the same camera and start taking pictures of orbs and look at them, you can start to train your eye because it's just like seeing an what's well, sort of like seeing an aura. It's beside, it's in, it's in diffuse awareness, not in focused attention. And um, but orb the beings, I think that they're plasma beings 
And what we started doing uh, in Egypt is filming them, taking a video with your little camera instead of taking a still picture. And then you'll see that they're, they're each individual. They move in different ways. They, they are, some of them are denser than others. Some of them move slow. Some of them move fast. Some of them float. And so inside the uh, pyramid, the, underneath the body, Bosnian pyramid, underneath the passageways, uh, Dr. Sam Osmanigat sent me a video recently of him interviewing Eric von Daniken, and they're just talking to each other because they're not perceiving them, and the, there's all these orbs flying around them. And so um, people who go for this um, are collecting pictures, and they're all over the place. It seems that these orbs are attracted to sacred sites, they're attracted to music and joy and, um, they, and animals. And so when we do the dancing horse party in view of the pyramids on the Egypt trips, there's orbs that are like a blizzard, literally. You can hardly see the people. So this is a real phenomena where I think beings from the other side, not ETs in a spaceship, but beings, are showing themselves for those who can see. You can train yourself to see them for real, I can see the flashes of light when they come. Um, some of them are different colors. They're light crop circles in there becoming more sophisticated. I think that the beings have to densify their energy from the refined place that they are. And uh, we need to refine our energy so we can meet them. So they densify, we refine, and you can see them and you can photograph them. Now, we did do an experiment. There's this woman and we, people referred to her as the orb lady. And she used to travel with her little book of pictures of orbs. And so I said, how about this? If she can take pictures of orbs and you don't know if you can or not, why don't we all give her our cameras and then see what she gets? And she was able to take pictures of orbs with anybody's camera that we gave her. And so that means that something about her energy is meeting them, attracting them, and then she takes their picture. So again, it's a phenomena that we don't really understand, but to me, they're really real because I've seen so many pictures with them in it. Yeah, speaking of entities that um, might be real, uh, one thing that Zachary Sitchin talked about in his book, Stairway to Heaven, uh, I did enjoy reading it, say what you want about Sitchin, but um, did enjoy it, and one thing he talked about was the Pharaoh's journey to the afterlife. Um, in regards to what he would see and what process he would have to go through. Are you open to the idea that Sitchin's description of the pharaoh um, going into the afterlife to seek immortality is an accurate description of what a pharaoh would have um, seen had they gone through that process after they died? Well, it wouldn't have just been a pharaoh. They didn't have a word for death. And so they didn't think about dying and going to the afterlife. They thought about cosmology and what really existed out there and the fact that we're spiritual beings having an earth experience, and even the symbol for the body is a forked staff, and it never touches the ground. So the Egyptians were very aware that we were just visiting here. We were touching down. So those words of your question are, again, tied to our belief system. And so I would want to rephrase what they were doing and I think that the high-level initiates, the priests and the priestesses, very definitely there were both. They were trained in different places. And they would blend the energy of the feminine and masculine. And the, it wasn't a queen and a pharaoh. It was, it, was, it was high-level initiates that understood about the feminine and the masculine. So we only talk about the pharaoh. We talk about the king. We talk about death and the afterlife. And that's not really what they meant, but sort of along those lines. I think the languaging needs to be adjusted. Okay, uh, George Kavasilis, in my interview with him, talked about uh, Akhenaten for a little bit. He um, said he believes that Akhenaten was an Anunnaki, uh, another word that's strongly associated with Zachariah Sitchin, and he said that Akhenaten was a very benevolent guy. It was the uh, priestly class that um, were the people that were the real bad guys, and Akhenaten was some sort of a, I guess, a savior of sorts, if you will, to... Um, raise consciousness, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so Akhenaten, he's one of the most misunderstood pharaohs in all of Egypt. Do you think maybe George is onto something? And if not, what do you believe about him? Well, when George said that in his lecture here in Victoria, I had a shudder go through me, and I just about got up and walked out. 
because I've studied a lot about the Amarna period and and Naknaten and Nefertiti and the kids, the six daughters, and what went on there is very near and dear to my heart. And that just drove the point home out. Anybody can say anything. And I don't know where he got it or what kind of channeling whoever, but how do you know that these guys aren't channeling some negative entity that just wants to confuse everyone? Because if you really dig deep, and there's almost nothing positive said about him, um, they had quite a phenomena going on there. And, you know, we haven't had peace on the planet since Amarna. And that was, you know, you know, it was equality for every, well, it was equality is a funny word, but, you know, it was a creative society, it was artistic, it was peaceful, it was beautiful, there were flowers everywhere, and it was pure because they broke away from the Amun priesthood. We still say amen. It's like it's, they were the evil, you have to pay for your salvation, and I'm not in every case, I forgot it. You know what, we're starting over, they closed the temple. Well, then they say he was crazy, and then they opened the temples, and everybody lived happily ever after. No. But that is kind of like the situation we have now, where the church says, give us half your, or the government says, give us half your money, and the church says, if you come to church, we'll show you how to have salvation. And, and not saying you can have the salvation within yourself or the, the purity and the empowerment. So I couldn't, I, I, I disagree 100% on that one. Okay, and uh, since you've um, heard about the Anunnaki quite a bit, one thing that George Kavasso said, I want to see if you agree or disagree on this. He said the term Anunnaki, it actually refers to a hodgepodge of entities, universal entities, who are the children of a universal geneticist entity known as Anu. And the Anunnaki from Nibiru that Zechariah Sitchin talked about is just one faction of Anunnaki. The ones from Nibiru are claimed to be mostly malevolent, but they're not but there are some benevolent ones, which kind of makes sense because they treat us as a slave species after all. Um, but with that being said, uh, Anunnaki referring to a universal geneticist entity's children, do you think maybe there's something to that? You know, this is, I'm feeling exhausted with all of these speculative questions because how would we ever know? Now, in my book, I have a chapter on Anana who was one of them. And the take on it is it's, 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 it's it, it, talking about temple priestesses in 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 uh, Sumer, Babylon, and all of that, and um, the whole thing is interpreted as good guys and bad guys and evil. And to me, it's just a projection screen for for anybody to say whatever they want. But they always end up saying that they're scary and they're controlling us. And how do we know that isn't a projection of what's going on right now with the cabal? I mean, I don't know how to answer those questions definitively. I don't think anyone can answer those questions. And a lot of what the people that you've mentioned and said are contradictory. And, and, and how, can, how can they show? I mean, this isn't research, Andrew. This is channeling or whatever you want to call it. But if you were to compare all the different things that everybody said, like a literature review and a publishable research study, how do you explain that everybody's pulling something different and give its belief? It turns out to be belief. No? Is it more than that? I don't know if it is. Like how, if you sat down with somebody and they wanted, like I do, because I teach quantitative research methods to grad students, if they wanted to do a credible study, they don't have a leg to stand on. You know, you have to compare what you say to other people. There has to be something that grounds it. So you, and this is a free form now because anybody can say, oh, yeah, the Anunnaki, I, I know. And then everybody's saying something contradictory. Everything that you said about 1212 was contradictory. I, I don't feel comfortable with that. There's got to be something that we can say that's grounded, which is why what they did with the Pyramid Code 2 and scrambling it all up and saying that, you know, uh, Quetzalcoatl was castrated and Atlantis is in Edmonton, Alberta, and... Uh, Foam woman was in the Atlantic Ocean and were the watchers. It, it doesn't even make sense. So, I'm sorry, I have a problem with all that. Well, I'm the kind of radio host that will expose and bring to light contradictory statements made by people in similar areas of research. And I always tell people, don't worry about your difficulties understanding the nature of reality. I can assure you that my difficulties are still greater, and that's why I'm the host of this show. And by the way, I did borrow that from Einstein's quote, don't worry about your difficulties in math. I can assure you that mine are still greater. <laughs> but but anyway, uh, let's talk about the divine feminine for a little bit, because uh, uh, you did write a book about the evolution map of feminine consciousness and I'll start off with a bang George Kavaslis again he says Earth's moon is artificial 
and it is the ball and chain around Earth's feminine energy, Mother Earth being a feminine energy dominant planet. Um, there is a whole backstory about how the moon, Alex Collier talked about this, uh, the moon was brought from Chalta the, in the Ursa Minor star system, constructed there and brought here by ben, benevolent ETs, and and they used it as to seed DNA and genes on, on Earth, but then about... Uh, uh, shortly before the fall of Atlantis, Earth came under the clutches of the Draconian Empire, the Reptilians that David Icke became famous for talking about, and um, they stole the moon, trashed it, and they've been using it as a matrix creator ever since. And Norman Burgrun has talked about how the Saturn's rings are um, not natural, they're artificial and crystalline, and people like David Icke and Alfred Weber and even George Kovacilis talked about this, and I discussed this in my interview with him in my private session, which is on my YouTube channel, about how, yeah, the Saturn moon matrix is real, the Saturn's... um acts as a giant broadcasting system to broadcast holographic energy down to Earth, and the moon acts as an amplifier which puts the energy down to, to Earth to uh, keep us in a matrix where feminine energy is suppressed, there's the illusion of time, and we're in a cycle of going to work, getting up in the morning, going to work, going to bed after watching some TV on a five to, out of seven days a week and all. I mean, but the, the specific thing that pertains to your work is the moon being the ball and chain around Earth's feminine energy. What do you got to say about that? Well, what you just, I mean, I'm just feeling so scrambled listening to all these different things. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like kind of getting blurry here because it's not tied to anything. To link the moon to a ball and chain to TV to seven days a week and everything, there's an explanation for all these things, but we've got to comb through it. When I first heard David Icke and George Kavos let's talk about the moon being fake. Well, first of all, most of the lunar consciousness, the lunation cycles that women's menstrual cycles are tied to and the moon, not worship, but honoring moon cycles, is key to the whole matriarchal planting cycles and all of that. And so, you know, there's a lot with the Mayan calendar that talk about lunation birthdays. And with one cell stroke of the pen and saying it's fake, you can wipe all that feminine tradition out. Well, the ball and chain around the feminine is patriarchal consciousness, patriarchal ways of being and thinking. You disconnect everything, disconnect the feminine. You know, Zeus, you knocked, gave him an axe on his head and he gave birth to Athena. You don't even need a womb anymore. This has really hurt culture and hurt the planet. And so we think that matriarchy is then women going to drag men around. No, matriarchy is about balance. Matriarchy is about leaving more of the seven generations ahead of us for the children, the children seeing wisdom in, in, the, in, in the wise ones and the elders, respecting the earth, uh, living with a, you know, a small footprint, taking only what you need, all this stuff. Well, we are so far away from that. And again, anyone can say anything because he's standing at the front of the room. And you know, everybody who's sitting down doesn't know anything. And then people start to repeat what each other says. It's unverifiable. No one's going to the moon. NASA doesn't disclose what, you know, everything. He channeled it. But even in the sentence, I mean, like I had a really hard time sitting there listening to him. And I, I like him. You know, I'm not trying to criticize the person. It's the style. It's the way we were taught that gives people license to stand at the front and say whatever they want. And the people sitting down have to listen. It's not a discussion. It's a delivery it's an I know, and they talk as if it's all true. That's television. And it's not, what are you saying for some kind of an interactivity? Is it possible? Where are the possible things that would link it? There, nobody's giving any evidence when they say things like this. How could you ever know if the moon is fake? I don't know. And I research things. I'm familiar with these people. I'm familiar with what they've said. There's nothing you've said so far where I haven't heard it from them. Okay? So I'm not trying to be contradictory. I'm trying to ground things in reality. And you can speculate. You can say, I wonder if the moon is fake. And here's why I've come to think that. I channeled it isn't good enough. I said it and I know because I said so isn't good enough for me. Right? So I don't know how you check that. But the thing is, what does the statement do? It's saying there's an external reason for the feminine to be denigrated. I don't agree. The feminine can be elevated within the, the feminine inside a, a man. Um, the feminine, feminine consciousness is what you can't see. Feminine consciousness is symbolism. It's, it's dream time. It's timelessness. It's being 
misinterpreted. I don't think when they say that they know what feminine consciousness is or if you can shut it down by a fake moon. I don't think you can do that. So, um, sorry, I'm getting huffy. Okay, you're entitled to your own um, opinion on the matter, but in regards to... Do you uh, think the moon could be fake? Do you think uh, the moon could be fake? Well, since you mentioned it, okay, first of all, what are the odds that it perfectly eclipses the sun? Second of all, what are the, it rang like a bell when NASA spacecraft landed on it. Uh, third of all, as Jim Mars exposed in his book, Our Occulted History, um, the Earth, uh, the Moon's uh, center of mass is in a different location than its uh, center of gravity, so it should have a wobbly orbit, but no, it has a perfectly circular orbit, uh, well, 99.9% perfectly circular, and um, it does not rotate, or if it does rotate, it ro- rotates at the same speed as the Earth. Uh, um, as the as it as it revolves around the earth um which is a rarity just like the size of the moon being um so big compared to its planet and last but certainly not least the uh, all the moon's craters except for the really really small ones go down to the same depth which um shows that some impenetrable artificial surface must exist below the moon dust i mean is that convincing enough for you that the moon is artificial well is that enough to harness feminine energy, and repress it, even if what you just said is true. Like tying the two together is a leap. And the feminine consciousness is denigrated. It is denigrated, but not because, of the, not because of that. Maybe, maybe. But we need to be a little looser here. With We need to put the facts together in a way that doesn't jump around so much and makes definitive statements. It needs to be open for discussion. And that's why I get a little jumpy when I hear people, it is, it is, it is, it is, and therefore. That's not how you do research. It's not how you open a conversation for discussion. And the evidence is missing. Some of that evidence you gave, but the association and the correlation with feminine consciousness is is empty. There's nothing there. That doesn't mean there isn't, that doesn't mean we couldn't work our way into something with some evidence and some discussion that would bring other ideas. It's just the way it's being delivered wholeheartedly with definitive facts that just isn't how you, it's not how you make new discoveries. Sorry. Well, everybody looks at it differently. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that would say, well, I refuse to believe the moon is artificial because I can't handle the truth. It sounds too scary. And, um, well, well, that's not what I'm saying. Sorry, Andrew, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying the moon is or isn't. I'm saying you can't come out with, all of what you said in the question, all stuck together without an openness to discuss the pieces. He's coming to a conclusion before teasing out the facts. He's doing what TV does. It is, it is, it is. Not it could be, it may be, how could this be? That's the difference. And yes, what you said. Some people could just reject that the moon, but I'm talking about all the associations that are tied with it, that he's got no ground. I don't think he has. But you know what I'm saying? I just that when somebody just hands you this thing that this is the new thing and this is what is, I mean, and I, I know when I first heard it, I'm like, come on. But there's a lot of things when I first heard it, I would come on and you keep listening and then you soften up or you don't. But it has to be linked to something that can be measured or can be, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just, I'm talking about methodology here, more than I'm talking about whether it's true or not. Well, I'm open-minded. Well, I'm open-minded. I do, use, I do use discernment, huh? even though I am. I am. I do use discernment, even though I am open-minded. Be open-minded. Question everything. Use discernment, but don't question everything to the point where you say, "Well, I'm going to question that just because I should question everything," because that's because then you're going to start acting stupid when you start questioning things that are incontrovertible. But um, I, I don't really want to digress too much on that because uh, we've got a little less than a half an hour to go, and there's some things I would like to talk about, uh, specifically about. Uh, female energy, because there's a debate going on here. Everybody's saying we got to increase the feminine energy, got to increase it, because as long as the feminine energy stays suppressed, then uh, Mother Earth is going to be stuck in a matrix. But that seems to contradict what other people say about you have to have a balance between the male and female energies. And those same people would say that all the people who say you got to uh, increase your feminine energy, and maybe in some cases obsessive about increasing feminine energy, are 
demonizing, for lack of a better phrase, the male energy. But of course, the feminine energy enthusiasts would say, no, we're not demonizing male energy. We're uh, just not giving it a lot of credit because we realize what's at stake. Uh, I don't know. Well, you understand the debate here, um, increasing feminine energy while caring less about male energy versus trying to just have an overall balance between the two. I mean, with Mother Earth being a feminine energy dominant planet, that probably factors some into this. Uh, How do you propose we draw a balance, if you will, on this subject? Okay, so what I just heard you say is, again, and I keep coming back to this, because the black and white, the, you know, the scientific model, if it's mathematical, is the patriarchal way of being and thinking. So it's either or. So when you say, well, just bring up the feminine, oh, no, no, you can't do that. No, it's a misunderstanding, because matriarchal consciousness is about balance. The problems on the planet is being out of balance and denigrating things that are nurturing and all of that. I mean, if you've had a baby, you don't think it's a good idea to kill somebody else's baby. And so it's this dis- the only way soldiers can go into villages and kill people is if they've been disconnected, if they practice on video games and they don't feel. Or if you do a hierarchical thing, I'm better, you're not, therefore I can kill you. And so all of that is a way that's just been entrenched. I said it before, the, the, the agenda of the patriarchy is to erase evidence of everything other than itself. They burned all the Mayan texts and all the things that spoke about periodicity and, 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 and synchronicity and, and all of these things that are dream time that you can't see. So if you move over into an idea of more balance, you, you end up being more balanced. And what's interesting is more men are reading my book now than when it first came out. And so and if you go to the grocery store or the park, you see lots of men with their, their children. But when we grew up, men, oh, no, no, that's women's work, and men are supposed to make the money, and all of that was separation. And so we will not make it as a planet if we don't somehow nurture the feminine in men, women, children, all across the board. And all that means is like when you say, oh, angels, what's that? Oh, or they don't exist. Oh, what do you mean? That's conspiracy theory. All of that is coming from the patriarchal mindset that school television, society, consumerism teaches us. All of that is about selling things. One person getting rich at the expense of somebody else, taxing people. A matriarchal culture, would, in the truest sense of the word, would have no money. It would be contributionism. It would be love. It would be sharing. It would be listening in a different way. So you don't just go shopping for feminine consciousness. And you're saying, you know, feminine energy, female energy. What is that? You can have a militant female. You can have a woman who acts totally patriarchal. And you can have a man who's completely balanced in his feminine consciousness and, you know, men may not like him or think he's too effeminate. We have this so distorted. And if you look at movies, there's gender benders. And the messages that we're getting from, from movies and all of that is just, confusing and that's not what it means it's not what it means okay i'd like to go back to ancient egypt for a moment because there's a little bit of a debate going on here they say that the ancients not just the egyptians but other people in antiquity other civilizations they depicted what they saw however some other people um i guess uh one good example people who believe the work of david ike would assert that while there is a lot of truth to the claim that the ancients depicted what they saw, a lot of the depictions that we see are not things that they saw, but actually things that they were brainwashed into believing are true, because as people like David Icke and Jordan Maxwell have talked about, all the religions are fake in the sense that they suppress your consciousness by making you believe that you have to worship some higher being of some sort um, when you yourself are already that high being because you're already infinite consciousness. So it's not in your best interest to follow a religion, even though religions do teach benevolent things. And they would assert that a lot of the religious figures throughout history their depictions on walls and cave drawings and whatnot, and also the Egyptian temples, they they didn't depict what they saw. They just depicted what they were brainwashed into believing was real. And who brainwashed them? Well, that's the whole thing about the Anunnaki, the reptilians, the greys, and other bad races of aliens that you would talk about. Um, but this whole issue of they, whether or not the ancients depicted what they saw or whether or not their depictions were um, – fraudulent beliefs that they were brainwashed into believing are true. Um, Is it easy to um, determine which is which, or do you think this is an area that we will forever have a lot of difficulty with? First of all, what you see on the temple walls isn't religion. 
Okay, and we'll never know if they saw it or it was symbolism. But there's always an agenda, and we until we can become conscious enough to separate our egos from our higher selves, we will see through the lenses of what we were taught. And so pretty much everything you see about ancient Egypt, it's been pretty frustrating, has been somebody say, oh, that's what they're doing, or that's what they're doing, and they're not. And so I've been staring at pictures of Egypt since 1977 and um, pouring over them. And there's loads of things that I missed in the early days. I didn't, I didn't have enough perception to see it. I didn't see the patterns. Um, and, there, and, and I said before, like I do think about past lives and, and from then we had future lives. Like if, if it was us and we knew the whole thing was going to come tumbling down into this dark bloodbath from death, because matriarchal is blood from life, where menstrual blood is the highest form of DNA and they used it in their planting, they used it in their rituals. When the patriarchs took over, they started doing the blood sacrifice, kill, a, kill a, an animal and use the blood. Because now we don't need menstrual blood. But blood from death is not the same as blood from life. And this whole thing about putting the, the, the death into the shadow has caused us to show all this stuff of death and violence and torture on TV and death and violence and torture everywhere. This is not, it's just we're so distorted and we're so limited in our ability to understand the ancients, especially if we're looking from our perspective. So religion and they made it up or they didn't, what are we looking at? Can we clear ourselves and see what these symbols are with a little bit of help? But, you know, when I have the Egypt trips, it's like I'm, I turn the symbols and say, okay, if this symbol meant this and this symbol meant that, look at this fresco and make a sentence or something like that where instead of telling you what it is, what do you see? And these things are so pure, and the shapes of the temples resonate with the, the, the cavities of the human body. So even if you're completely unconscious, if you stand in a temple, it's going to affect you. And if you just look and let the images come into your being, it will do something to you, whether you can concretize it and understand or not, um, remains to be seen. So we take it at face value. Some things are distorted. And the other thing in Egypt is you see the later, later, later as you got to Ramses, maybe that was, you know, a pile of hands and he cut off the enemy's hands and that's right at the Karnak Temple. So we need to be able to see what's the more recent, which would have been distorted. What's the oldest? And if you look at Dendera and Abydos, you've got the older temples are underneath. They're deeper. And the symbols there are purer. And then the Amarna period and Hatshepsut in the 18th dynasty, they were percolating up some of the ancient knowledge. They had a little bit of peace. They had a little way that they could settle and remember the past. So the 18th dynasty was well into the patriarchal era of Egypt. But that doesn't mean that they weren't somehow pulling from the ancient purity. Just the way there's Buddhist monks sitting in temples in Asia right now. But, you know, Buddhist, Buddhism monks and, 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 you know, meditating your whole lifetime isn't something we do now. So we need to take them at face value, I think. And, and, but the interpretation, we need to take our lenses off of culture now to understand it. And it is possible to do that. And so they were really sophisticated and they had abilities. This beam me up, Scotty, by location, teleportation is real to them. Cosmology, beings from other planets, our place in the universe, this is real to them. And it's only in the last while that we've even had quantum physics to understand wormholes that look like a boat. And they said the pharaoh rode on a boat to the other side. Well, the boat had watermarks. So the real boats were seafaring. But the symbolic boats may have been wormholes and stargates. So... We, we, it takes a lifetime, it's taken me a lifetime, um, to understand more about what they were trying to say. But we definitely have to leave culture and everything that we've learned here aside to understand the ancients, for sure. Right, right. One thing that's uh, hard to understand regarding uh, the ancients is uh, religious figures. Are you perhaps open to the idea that many of the uh, uh, fake... Uh, well, maybe religious is not the best word to use. I say religious figures, but um, like the pantheon of gods of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, too. I mean, even Akashic Records leader Andrew Bartz has said, Jesus did exist. He was a solar being. His story, however, has been twisted. Is it possible that you can make a similar case with all the religious gods, figures, and pantheons, and uh, religious uh, gods and all throughout history? Are you open to the possibility that they all did exist in some form of consciousness, but their stories have been twisted. Yeah, 
that 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 is what I think. And Jordan Maxwell has done us a big favor, and he started a long time ago, you know, looking at the linguistic roots, which is what Hakeem does, which is why I did my PhD in linguistics because it teaches you to look around corners. And so Jordan Maxwell has really looked at how Catholicism, the Vatican. How is the Vatican, the Vatican, the city of London and Washington are all independent states and what's their agenda and what have they done? Like, you know, most people don't have the capacity to understand all of that. And so, um, and he's helping us by going bit by bit. But again, we need to look in time frame because Catholicism, you know, whatever, the Roman Catholic Church, is roughly 2,000 years old, okay? And so how has things from the distant past, you know, like, you know, the, and even Greece wasn't that much um, younger. I mean, it's it's right there too. And so it, it, it's a bigger question and it needs careful analysis, not just a conclusion, quick conclusion. Right. Other things, two things that require a lot of analysis before coming to quick conclusions. Let's see if we could try to kill two unrelated questions in with one stone here. Uh, Christopher Dunn says that the way they cut those rocks was with a huge saw, but he's an engineer. He doesn't uh, talk about maybe space technology at all cutting the saw. And also um, the fact that Egyptian tombs were found to contain uh, tobacco and cocaine, which are native to the uh, Western Hemisphere. So why are they in Egyptian tombs? Um, I mean, they would some would say, well, they sailed across the Atlantic and then brought it back. But who's to say they sailed? Maybe they used some other higher technology. So the whole thing about Christopher Dunn's theory about a saw cutting stones and them using ships to sail across the Atlantic to get the tobacco and the cocaine, do you think those people are being a little too close-minded when they say that that's how they did it? Okay. Um, again, we've been taught we're the smartest we've ever been. We keep saying we're so sophisticated, we're so evolved. So how could the ancients have technology that we don't have yet now? That's, 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 that's one thing that really blocks our thinking. There are machine tool marks. They're all over the place. The only way you could do it was with something that, that you know, diamond drill bit or something that, that didn't have electricity, which is explosion energy as opposed to implosion energy. They did have a source of power. There's no soot inside the crypt where there's no windows. And somebody had to be down there with light or else they couldn't have carved or poured the, the stone. So they did have technology. We may not be able to explain it. Uh, maybe it's, again, to me, it's too easy to say an extraterrestrial came down and did it. Okay. And okay, if you want that as an answer, fine. But you can't argue that they had the technology. Okay. How we explain it may push everybody's button. Um, we need to explain it because they had it. The evidence is there, period, all over the place. A, the tobacco and cocaine weren't found in the tombs, as far as I know. Every mummy that's tissue has been analyzed had not only tobacco and cocaine, but THC. Actually, tobacco, I don't know, cocaine and THC, which is the chemical in, in they call it bango, in marijuana. And so um, perhaps, I don't know about the tobacco. But it wouldn't have been cigarettes with filters that you bought at the drugstore. So it's true that the ancient Egyptians had access to mind-altering substances. And it could have been cocoa leaves, not the refined thing that looks like sugar powder. But the, the boats that are on the plateau that were found in these pits have watermarks on them. In the museum, there's little figures with their little uh, oars and their, their, their like, is that a fantasy about, you know, you see on these little replicas of boats and they're in, in the Metropolitan Museum and in the, in the Egyptian Museum where you see the people making bread and making wine and, you know, doing it right there. And so uh, perhaps that was realistic. Again, we'll never know. But there's, as long as we think the Egyptians didn't travel, and the Atlanteans weren't worldwide. And when people say Atlantis was here, it was here with Bimini, it was in the middle of the, the Azores of Islands, it was here, it was here at the plateau in South America. It's all of that. There's no need to say Atlantis was here and not there. It likely was worldwide. And it's likely that the Earth masses had different shorelines because of the rising and falling of water. But yes, you can kill two birds with one stone. The evidence shows us that the Egyptians use these substances or had them in, they must have used them if they're in their tissue in the mummy tissue and it's my understanding from research 
that every mummy that was analyzed had it. So take that wherever you want. You can agree. You can disagree. That's a fact. Okay, okay. Uh, one more thing about Egypt uh, I'd like to talk about. I guess we'll make this the last specific thing about Egyptian archaeology before uh, we got about uh, nine minutes left, just so you know. Uh, that temple in one of the episodes of um, the Pyramid Code that Rabu Buval set out on a trek to go to, um, refresh my memory, what was the name of that uh, temple site and what does he see in that that's so significant? You mean Naptaplaya? It wasn't Naptaplaya. a temple, it was a standing stone circle? Yeah, right, right, yeah, Naptaplaya, that, that's coming back to me, yes. What is so fascinating about that place? It got a lot of glory in an episode of Ancient Aliens, if I remember correctly. What is it about? Well, and that was, that was my footage that they used for that. Oh, because that, after we after we took that footage, uh, there's no fence and there's no protection. People just drove their Land Rovers over the top and knocked some of those stones down and destroyed it because they don't have any reverence for it. Okay, so again, the dating and everything that was there, there was an, a couple of expeditions that happened. It's down near the corner of where Sudan and Egypt um, meet. And... Um, in the Pyramid Code, there's the thing about the cave of the swimmers. Okay, so if, okay, think. If ancient Egypt is older than 10,000 years, whatever, um, and there was a world flood, and the flood was caused by a possible asteroid hit, which is, there's evidence of how that might have gone round because the Atlanteans had a prophecy when the head of the crab hits the heart of the lion, and that means that the, the constellation of, Cancer would smash into the constellation of Leo. Well, how does that happen? Um, that was an Atlantean prophecy. And then at the Temple of Bandera, the, the round, so-called round zodiac that Napoleon took and replicated and put the fake one up in Egypt is not the round zodiac. That's not the real name. The name is the calendar of catastrophe. And since the style hall at Bandera was cleaned, there's a linear uh, zodiac, and it points precisely to the year of the flood. And you see all the pre-flood and all the post-flood. And that was 13,660 years ago, as precise as that. So when Graham Hancock says plus or minus or approximately 10,500 BC, add 2,000 years, you're in the ballpark. But that's what it's meant. And this is something that Svetlana Pavlova out of Russia uh, came up with. And when you look at it, and she's given us some clues to it, it makes sense. If there was an asteroid that hit us and our grid went down and our computers didn't work anymore and it was cold and you're, you know, up in Canada here, you couldn't stay in your house for very long. So you'd probably have to go find a cave and light a fire and, you know, skin a bear or whatever and get some clothes and make some food and make arrows. Like, it's not that these people didn't have technology three days ago. It's the grid went down. And so... For the Egyptians who followed the movements of Sirius and the Pleiades and all these star systems, they, let's imagine that this, this thing happened and that there, there was a flood. Um, the Cave of the Swimmers um, shows people swimming. And uh, Napta Playa is associated with Gilf Kabir. Gilf means plateau, Kabir means big. It's the size of Switzerland. And so people who were swimming around who didn't die could easily have pulled themselves up onto this landmass that was above the flood, and then what? So they find a cave, they draw themselves swimming on the inside of the cave, and that's represented in the English patient, that movie. And then they would start. Here comes Sirius, here's the pole star, and they would start with their stone circles so that they would figure out what their place in time was, time and space. And that's what now the play is. And so they've done a lot of measurements to realize that and this was a place that had water. And so when they had the cattle cults later, because, I mean, the whole, if the whole planet, had, if the world flood, I mean, myths are there. We know something happened. People would have had to start over. And they would be nomadic until they figured out how to start civilization again. And so this is where they would have done their signposts and put stones to measure. And so whatever, it, it stands to reason that it has to do I mean, the thing is, too, with those stones, you can knock them over if you run your Jeep over the top of them. So they're not like Stonehenge. They're not that big. But they are related in terms of, you know, how Stonehenge, the, the sun comes up, the eclipses, and the, the solstices and equinoxes line up in certain ways. Well, that's the, that's the parallel structure. That's the similar thing. 
And that's what NAFTA Playa is, in my understanding. Uh, thanks. And I guess we'll close on a really, really important subject. Save the best for last. Uh, just so you know, you got about four and a half. Well, I'll tell you how long you have after I say this. But the future of um, Egyptian archaeology and finding artifacts and also the future of what, how how the best way to get the truth out about what happened in ancient Egypt um, is going to be like. And, bef and one thing I do want you to touch on. Uh, Zahi Hawass, I think he's someone we need to have on our radar because I can't help but wonder if he's in on a conspiracy to cover up the true history of ancient Egypt. Well, I remember on an episode of Chasing Mummies, I saw uh, some guy said, Zahi, this could be evidence of extraterrestrials. And Zahi Hawass said, you tell me extraterrestrials, get out of here. You're no longer working for me. Uh, I, either he's really close-minded or he is on a conspiracy to cover something up. So the future of Egyptian archaeology, and I would like you to give your take on Zahi Was when you talk about this subject on the future of what you expect to see. And you got about um, four, uh, four minutes. Okay, well, um, Zahi is quite traditional and closed-minded, and he is very much, and, and he's gone now. He's, he's probably living in L.A. Um, he, I call him Dr. No, and Dr. Sam is Dr. Yes. And so anything, people, he would say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll help you with your research, and you can come and do an excavation, and yes, 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 yes. And then, you know, Scott Woodward was there with a the National Geographic team ready to drill into the tooth of um, King Tut. No, national security shut it down. And over and over and over again, people would do credible research, and um, and 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 then Zahi would take all their work, and then two years later he would come out with it as if it was his. And so that's also not fair. And when the golden mummies were found, uh, Zahi, you know, basically said it was his discovery. And the guy who actually found it was standing there going, "It's yours. You just got here." You know. So there's this again how the system works. This is how the established system works. But there has been a concerted effort to keep what they said in 1818 alive to, uh, if you want to be an Egyptian guide, you have to go to a, an Egyptian university and they give you scripts to read and mostly it's about the warring of, of um, uh, Ramses II and all that. So now the new uh, Minister of Antiquities seems to be a little bit more open-minded. Apparently last week, Robert Vival let me know this two days ago that They've opened the enclosure to the Sphinx. That doesn't mean you can go inside the Sphinx itself, but you can get closer to it. And, uh, and they have ads about come to Egypt, it's safe. But it's still at 5% what it used to be in terms of tourism. So I know people who you know, are interested in projects like the one I mentioned about um, the, under, um, the passageways at a different place underneath the pyramids. And um, they get checked out. They promise, 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 and if you want to move some sand, they're, it, they're so used to saying no that they pretty much say no. Now, the thing is, is that in the Bosnian pyramids, even though the mainstream media has been sworn and sealed to say it's fake, there's an awful lot going on there, scientifically. And Dr. Sam is Dr. Yes. So anybody who wants to come and measure something, whether they're geologists or, you know, biophysicists or who knows what, astrophysicists or energy workers or whatever. He says yes. And so I think, and, but the characteristic features of the Bosnian pyramid and the, and the Egyptian pyramids are similar because there's seven different features for a functioning pyramid and they all have to be there. And Dr. Sam has graced us with information about that and it happens to be true. So I don't know that we're going to be able to go in there and do excavations, and I've got a lot of experience with people who have approached me or have invited me to come with them to the Department of Antiquities, the chief inspectors, and present their, their research, and I see the difficulty. There is probably 80% of, of Egypt left to, to under, uncover, but they're not doing the work. And even if you were working full-time, like Dr. Sam is, he's nine seasons into his archeo archaeological stuff. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think we're just going to have to piece it together from other places. And uh, right now it seems like Dr. Sam has got the most exciting and active archaeological site on the planet. So we're going to have to piece it together with similar places and real science. Well said. And since we've come to the end of this show, I guess I'll tell you the same thing I tell all my guests. 
while you are a fascinating individual, and while I'm sure I could do a second show with you if I wanted to, I am on a mission, and one of my goals with this show and that mission is to get as many different people on the show as possible before I start giving any one specific guest double dips, as I feel that is the fairest and most impartial way and probably the best informative way to get information out on a show. So that does, I regret to say, mean that I will probably not be letting you on the air on this show again, but that's only because I need to give a lot of other fascinating individuals a chance at some glory on my show. But it was a pleasure having you. This was informative, and I will spread this interview far and wide. Thank you. Been a pleasure. All right. Been a pleasure. Take care, Carmen. Bye-bye. Later. Bye. Folks, next week on the show, we will have Donnie Gilson, best known for interviews with Alvin Weber. He is a uh, whistleblower of sorts. He's also 32nd Freemason. I guess we'll talk about Freemasonry for a little bit. So Donnie Gilson next week. So without further ado, namaste.